This video is brought to you by Sporlin. Quality, integrity, and tradition. Well, we got a service call that a walk-in freezer is not working. So, ooh, that hurts. Um, there's a power switch up there. It doesn't look like it's iced up or anything. It's actually, like, rather thawed. It's like an ice wiener right here. You want that? Here you go. You can have an ice wiener. Throwing that to my helper. Um, all right. Yeah, nothing going on there, so. All right, we're gonna get up All right, top. this is my walk-in freezer, I believe this old unit right here. Yeah. So we're gonna get this guy opened up and see if we can figure out what's going on with it. Um, the condenser, surprisingly, doesn't look too bad. The reason why I say surprisingly is I'm gonna take you over here. This restaurant's notorious for this kitchen AC getting plugged within two weeks of cleaning it. That's a solid blanket right there. Um, so I was surprised that this isn't, this freezer isn't that dirty. I mean, it could be dirty on the inside, but anyways, we're gonna get the covers and everything all taken off and have a look at it. Something's obviously happening because the evaporator fan motors don't have any power and we checked all the breakers seems like they're all on so we'll check power here and see because this is the master control for this unit power comes up here through the defrost clock then is sent downstairs so this unit um, is the master control for everything we should have three fat three phase power goes into the disconnect then comes through the fuses into this terminal block right here okay 202 one to two two to three and then one to three so we have three phase power coming into this unit, but it's not running for some reason. If we come over here and we look very closely, we have a green light on the time clock. That's an indication that more than likely it has power. The next thing we're gonna do is uh, go grab the schematic cover, which is that small little panel right there. Bring that over here. Okay, if we set this down right here. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna give this schematic a little look right here, okay? So this schematic, is going to tell us how power is going to run through this unit. Essentially, what we need to do is we need to find the defrost clock. Now, the defrost clock's down here on the schematic, and we need to check to make sure we have line voltage coming into the defrost clock. That'll be happening on one and N, okay? So one and N on this defrost clock, we should have 208 volts. And let's see, right there. Okay, so we have I say 208, but we bring in 202 into the building. So that's proper power going to the clock. The next thing is if it's in defrost, it will be sending power out on the number three terminal. If it's in refrigeration mode, it'll be sending power out on the number four terminal. So right now, we look at this defrost clock, there's a triangle right there. It's pointing to where the pins are in. It is not in defrost. So we should not have power between three and N. We should have nothing, and we don't. We don't have anything. But on the other hand, we should have power between four and N. Four and N indicates that we are in refrigeration mode and we're sending power downstairs to the liquid line solenoid valve in theory, and the liquid line solenoid valve should be turning on as long as the temperature is warm enough inside the box. Now we know the temperature is warm enough because it's warm in there. Unless someone got in there and started playing with the temperature controller, which I highly doubt it, this unit should be running right now. Now, okay. What I wanna do though, is let's do some quick checks before we go downstairs, okay? So what we are gonna do is we are going to just spin this condenser fan motor. Look, condenser fan motor is locked up. Come give that a spin real quick so you can see it. Now mind you, we still have power to this unit, so be careful. Now let's check this one. That condenser fan motor is working, free spinning, but this one is not free spinning. So more than likely, we are off on high pressure. So if we come over here and look at our schematic and we look, we need to look for the liquid line solenoid valve, right? And uh, what it's gonna do is, let's see, power is gonna come from the fuses. It's gonna run through the temperature controller, but it's also gonna go through high pressure 
low pressure and then to the compressor contactor. So assuming that the, the thermostat downstairs opens the liquid line solenoid valve right here, then the pressure should come up high enough that power that's always going through these pressure controls is applied to the contactor and it's not. And we can prove that by walking right over here. This is our pressure control. I'm pushing this button on here and it turned on. It turned on because that pressure control is doing its job and it's protecting the system from going off on high pressure because the condenser fan motor is bad. Condenser fan motor failed. It's, we're having uh, triple digit temperatures right now. So it's 102, 103 outside right now. And this thing can't handle those high pressures and it obviously went off on high pressure because it lost the condenser fan motor. So we need to go ahead and shut off power, which we have. We need to go ahead and get that condenser fan motor pulled out. We're gonna get it swapped out and then uh, we'll turn the system back on and see what's going on. So we've got a motor over there, we're getting it ready, but I'm gonna go ahead and give this condenser a rinse. Uh, we didn't bring hoses up, we just brought a pump sprayer because this thing doesn't look too bad. So we'll just clean it from both sides. So the first step is to get it wet, right? Nice and wet and get the bulk of the big stuff off from both sides. And then we'll apply a little cleaner to it. And uh, that way the cleaner has a good working surface to you know move through. So we're just gonna keep doing that, rinse the other side, then we'll get the cleaner on it. So we're gonna use some of the aerosol cleaner. I have two like cans that are basically half empty. So you're gonna spray it in here. This one's about empty, but I'm gonna use it up and then we'll use the other one. But just let it get on there, it'll foam up and we'll get it from all sides nice and good. And then the same thing on the other side. The other one hopefully has a little bit more in it and it'll actually spray. I'm just trying not to waste the little bit that I have left in this can. That one in better shape? Maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Alright. Oh yeah, a little bit better. Spray it on there. This one's running out too though, but yeah, we're getting a stream through. So we're just gonna get it all nice. I can see light through it. So this is more or less just getting the surface stuff off. Just keep going through all the way. Let it sit for a second and then we'll rinse it all off. Cool thing is that coil cleaner can be used to clean the brackets and everything too. So we're just giving that a quick little brush and rinse. It's not gonna be perfect. And like I said, I can already see light through this condenser, like to the other side. So it's not like it's plugged. We just thought we'd give it a rinse since we got a pump sprayer up here. So it's not like it takes a lot of cleaner or anything. Okie dokie, uh, we rinsed off the condenser. Like I said, it really wasn't that bad. Uh, we put in a new condenser fan motor. We used a 9721. It's all wired in for 230 volts. We can change the rotation if we need to. The wires are kind of secured. Um, this thing's ready to turn on. Let's see what happens. Hope it doesn't blow up. And it should be going... Nope, it's going in the wrong direction. So that's fine. That's why we test it. Okay. So all that we need to do is switch this around. Like that. I'll have to use two hands. But flip it around and then it'll go in the right direction. So this should be going... What is it? There we go. Now we're going in the right direction. Both of them. So both of them are moving air. We're going to let it run for a minute. Uh, the side glass is going to be flashing right now because the evaporator fan motors aren't running yet. And it's going to take a long time for the evaporator fan motors to get cold or the evaporator to get cold enough for the fan motors to start running. So we can go ahead and gauge up on it. And, uh, but we just can't evaluate it until we're hundred percent confident the evaporator fan motors are running. So it's currently about 105 up here. So we're going to watch this guy. We're going to set the time on the time clock. It's 320. Right about there. Looks like it's about to go into defrost, but I clicked it through, so it's going to be a little off. So we don't need a defrost right now. And we're running about 121 degree suction set or uh, liquid saturation. So it's about what, 103? So what's that, 20 something over ambient? So that's fine. You never want to be any more than 30 degrees over ambient uh, when you're using discharge pressure to ambient temperatures. Always be careful when you're checking liquid pressure because there could be a pressure drop across the receiver and the condenser. So we're on discharge pressure and suction pressure. Um, I don't even know though if the uh, evaporators are running yet. I honestly don't think so because it's not very cold. So it's going to take some time because that, that, that box is pretty warm. I think this thing's been down since yesterday probably would be my guess. They, they think that it was running this morning, but I doubt it. So we'll see though. So a question was asked to me when I was explaining the, the no more than 30 degrees over ambient from the liquid saturation temp. And I want to reiterate what I'm talking about here. 
So my thermometer over there said like 103, 104, whatever it was, right? My liquid saturation temperature is 120. So that means that we're approximately only 20-ish degrees over ambient temperature. So the liquid saturation temperature is only 20-ish degrees over the 103, 104 degree outside air temp, okay? We never wanna see any more than 30 degrees over ambient, but it's not a one-stop charging metric. You don't charge to 30 degrees over ambient. That's not how it works, but we're just looking at it. It's one metric that we look at, okay? Now, the question was asked, well, if it is over 30, does that mean it's overcharged? It could be. It could be a lot of things that could cause the condensing temp to be way too high. It could be a bad head pressure control valve, bypassing when it shouldn't be. It could be a dirty condenser. Had we troubleshoot, uh, troubleshot this unit with the bad condenser fan motor, we very likely would have seen more than 30 degrees over ambient. Uh, condenser fan motor can cause that. And another thing that people forget to look is box load, okay? It's not just the outdoor ambient temperature that affects the condensing temperature. The suction saturation temperature also affects the condensing temperature. If we're under an extremely heavy load in the box, it's 100 degrees in that box for whatever reason, and you turn it on and the evaporator fan motors come on and it's trying to absorb all that heat, you in theory could send this system into an overload situation. It may drive the head pressure up or it may just overload the compressor enough to where it runs high current that the compressor runs or turns off on thermal overload. So that is one of the reasons why evaporators on walk-in freezers do not start the, um, the fan motors right away. They do it to reduce the load, to shed the load so that way the box can slightly come down to temp, it gets the coil nice and cold, before it turns on the fans to try to reduce the amount of load that it's going to absorb, okay? So there's a lot of things, and this system works as a whole. So suction temperature, suction pressure, that's also gonna affect liquid temperature, liquid pressure, discharge pressure, or so be it, okay? Another thing to understand is suction saturation or superheat coming back, because we need superheat, right? Or we need a low enough superheat, because we don't want it to be too high, because if it's too high, then you got, don't got adequate compressor cooling coming back. This compressor is refrigerant cooled. It takes the cold suction gas coming back to help cool off the windings, the heat that's generated in that compressor. So we need the suction gas to be cold enough to help cool the compressor too. All right, so it works as a whole system. So we're just kind of cleaning up our messes. We're gonna take a few things down and go head down to the evaporators to see if they're running yet. So our evaporator fan motors are running. We confirmed all three of them, all right? So the, the coil's getting cold enough. It's starting to cool off the suction line, all right? Um, and we have a clear sight glass coming back. It might be a little bit hard to see. The sight glass is a little burnt from a dryer change, I think. But um, everything's looking good on this. It's gonna take a while for it to come down to temperature, so we're not gonna hang around. Um, but yeah, that's it. We got a clean condenser, new condenser fan motor, sight glass is clear, evaporator fan motors are running. That's all we can do. Big so picture stuff here, right? Always. So we went to go take the gauges off and this Schrader is leaking back here. I hooked onto this discharge Schrader and I can't get it to stop leaking. So we've got a swivel tee right here with the Schrader depressor in it. So we put some Schraders in both sides. We're gonna put some nylog on it, twist it on there, it'll depress it, then we'll put some caps on this, and that'll seal up the leak, because that Schrader, I've tried everything I can to get it to reset, and it won't reset. So, tried pushing on it, tightening it, loosening it, and it's just leaking out. If I just put a cap on it, it'll leak out through the gasket in that cap. But this right here, it'll make a good seal. All right, like I said, we are back and running, but it is gonna take some time. Summertime is here, it's getting warm, so. Triple digit temperatures. I think today's the might be the last day of triple digits for us until next week, but this is rubber band weather. We're not gonna be getting cool anymore. It's just gonna be in the 90s all next week, I think. Um, but uh, okay, so we got a service call on the walk-in freezer not working. When we got here, we found it was off on high pressure, and we found that one of the bearings on the condenser fan motor, the right side condenser fan motor was locked up. It wasn't allowing it to free spin, right? So we uh, reset the pressure control, turned it on, and sure enough, the condenser fan motor did not turn on when it had power applied to it. So we went ahead and um, replaced the condenser fan motor. We quickly cleaned the condenser. It wasn't really that dirty, but we just put some coil cleaner on it just to be sure, right? Rinsed off the stuff, installed a new condenser fan motor, got it all wired in, and uh, sorry, I'm like looking at the uh, unit being put back together, making sure it's all all's well, but. We, uh, we did our best, right? We cleaned it up, we 
looked at everything else. We watched the unit, made sure it had a clear sight glass. Uh, liquid saturation temperature wasn't any more than like 21, 22 degrees over ambient, which is not a bad thing. Um, so very important, we don't wanna be clearing a sight glass or adding refrigerant until we know that the evaporator fan motors are running. We verified that, but we didn't have to add anything. Other than that, I don't think there's gonna be much else wrong with this equipment, but understand that this has been down for a very long time. It was pretty warm in that box. So it's gonna be a long time before it's down to temperature, which is negative 10 in that box. It's gonna take some time. So I'm not gonna stand around and watch that. I'm gonna tell the customer that, hey, just monitor it, give me a call. My ticket will be open until tomorrow. If there's anything else going on, if it doesn't come down to temp, give me a call. But, you know, everything seems to be fine with it. So, um, I really appreciate you making it to the end of the video. I know this wasn't like a crazy technical one. It was just a condenser fan motor, but sometimes that's what it is. Sometimes that's all we got to deal with. It's just a condenser fan motor, you know? So, every day is different. We never know what we're going to run into. So, big picture when you're up here on the roof, make sure, you know, I walked around. I looked at all their ACs, looked if they had any error codes. We went ahead and brushed off that condenser on that AC that was all jacked up. Now it's not clean, but we brushed off the surface, right? But it doesn't have any high pressure codes or anything. So their maintenance is due. We'll get out here soon and clean the condensers on these things. But other than that, I don't really see anything else wrong. So thanks so much for making it to the end of the video. If you are interested in supporting the channel, you know, I say it every time, the easiest way to support this channel is watch the videos from beginning to end. That really is the easiest way. But you can also do so financially via PayPal, Patreon, YouTube channel memberships. Those are all different ways that you can choose to donate one time, monthly. Just There's links in the show notes of this video on how to get to those. Um, you can also go to my website, hvacrvideos.com, where we have merchandise available. It's a great way to help support the channel if you're interested in doing so. Uh, we order all the merch, uh, we inspect it, we ship it all from our house. My wife packages it, HVACR wife. She's the one packaging and shipping it. So whenever you guys place an order, it's coming from us, okay? We're not using aftermarket people. Of course, we're not making the hats, but you know. We got hats, stickers, we got a few t-shirts left, not many. We're phasing out the t-shirts and the sweatshirts, but we're gonna stick with the hats and the beanies. So uh, hvacrvideos.com. Last but not least, truetechtools.com. I've got an affiliate program set up with them. Uh, if you see some cool tools that I'm using in my videos, a good majority of the time, I picked them up from True Tech Tools, such as the S-Man 480V manifold that I was using in this video. So uh, go to truetechtools.com at checkout. I have an affiliate code, big picture. Now that's one single word, no space in between big and picture, okay? So big picture, put that in. Uh, it applies to the majority of the items on their website. I get a small commission when you do that and then you get a nice little discount. So it's a great way to help support the channel. Thanks so much for making it to the end and uh, I hope to catch you on the next one.